I'd now like to welcome Melanie Jane O'Reilly to the first presenter. Melanie is a social entrepreneur and a chief supporter of Unlimited and Described by David Cameron as inspiration, Melanie was awarded in 2012 for her services to the enterprise and women's enterprise. In Melanie supports social enterprise, charity and businesses to make sustainable positive difference. And hot off the press, Melanie has announced the Maserati 100, which recognises entrepreneurs, mentors, and advisors giving their time and resources to support the next generation of entrepreneurs. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and I'd like to pass you over to Melanie. Hello, everybody. I'll just do a quick check, Julie, that you can hear me okay. I'll assume that's a yes, then. Lovely. Well, welcome. So today's session is all about time to get noticed, but for all the right reasons. Um, it's really interesting to me that brands, big brands and celebrities spend a lot of time actually managing their public presence. And they're very, very good at using that public presence to help them to fulfill their aims and missions. And yet, for lots of us sitting out there, we tend to perhaps have it on our list of things to do, but never quite get round to it. So I'm hoping that today, I'll be able to help you to see that, firstly, it's a good thing, and it can help you to really, really further your social aims, but also that you can do it in a way that feels right for you, and that doesn't make you feel really uncomfortable, as, as it often can. So. Time to get this for all the right reasons. I'm just going to point out one of these on the bottom right-hand side of my slide there. You can see the independent, very kindly named me their business man of the week. So I would like to add that the journalist did actually interview me, and they did put a photograph of me. And whilst I have got short hair, as you'll see later on, I really don't think that I look like a man. And this is one of the interesting things where for, I'm ever immortalized in print as the business man of the week. They did change it on their website. But the journalist at the time actually said, I don't see what the problem is. It's a generic term. That actually started a whole interesting debate, ironically, in the newspaper and on their website about whether the businessman is a generic term or not. So that was a really interesting instance where I didn't go out seeking to start a debate. But because of something that appeared against my name, I got drawn into a whole set of discussions online and offline about generic terms. So <laughs> Therein lies the lesson, because one of the first things that people often say to me is, but nobody's interested in me. And I really resonate with that, because when I started out, I thought that too. You know, there's a little old me here in the Northwest doing my thing, doing it really well, and I assumed that absolutely nobody was interested in me. But here's what happened. My husband runs a social enterprise, and one day he came home, and his customer had actually cut out a press cutting that I'd been mentioned in because they realized I was his wife. We then started getting phone calls from people saying, I saw you in the paper. I got stopped in my local shop saying, I saw you in the paper. I didn't even know that I'd been in the local press, and that was the time at which I got my OBE. And all of a sudden, I started getting phone calls, emails, and so on from people. And it's the most surprising of people. And I suddenly realized that actually, from the conversations I was having, not only were they interested in me, and that was an obvious thing. I know lots of you will be sitting there and saying, well, I haven't got an OBE. But what really surprised me was how much they knew about me and things they commented on that told me that they'd actually been watching me for a while, and I kind of had this big brother moment when you're thinking, gosh, you know, is nothing safe if people have been watching me? And that taught me a really big lesson, because here's what really happens. Everybody's watching you these days, and from the most surprising of sources. So you might well expect that your suppliers and your customers would be watching you, and they certainly are. So are your partners. So the people that you might collaborate with or want to collaborate with, they're watching you too. Your competitors do. 
And Google's a wonderful thing because all they're doing is Googling you and having a look to see what comes up. And we'll talk in a minute about some of the places you're likely to come up and why that makes it so important that you're controlling the messages that are out there about you and your organization. Your team will be keeping a watching eye on what people are saying about you on and offline, but so will people who are thinking that they might like to work for you. For those of you who are volunteers, many of them will be too, and they learn an awful lot about your organization, and for some of them, it will also influence whether they choose to volunteer with you or not. Alongside this, here's a big one, funders. One of the things that was really interesting to me, and I write a lot of funding bits for organizations, is that the funders do online checks on you. So they check out the organization online. And also, of course, many of the funders are online, and we'll talk about that in a little while. So you have another opportunity to perhaps engage with them. And for any of you who are out there trying to win public sector contracts, the commissioners do. They will almost inevitably Google your organization and you to actually understand more about you. Now, that can't be fed into any, any formal tendering process, but for those small contracts that fall below that, they're absolutely looking at you. And here's the one that really came home to me around that time with my husband's customer, is I've never met that customer. So it's not only the people who know me and in my network that are looking at me, but it's all the people who know them as well. And that's one of the, the interesting advantages, but also the challenges in today's digital world, is that lots of people who have never met you actually can feel like they know you, which makes it even more important that we control what they actually get to know. So, why are they checking you out? Well, some of these are very obvious, but some of them perhaps you might not have thought about. And the reason why I'm showing them is it will help you to think about, as we move forward, what kind of messages would you like to be controlling so that you're making sure you're attracting the right attention. So one of the things that I find really fascinating these days is that if somebody says that they've done something, you can pretty much go online and check. So prior to our online digital world, it would be much more difficult and the only way you'd be able to check would be to ring somebody up or go and see somebody. But now, pretty much people validate things online. Alongside that, they're looking at your reputation. And as part of your reputation, they're looking at things like who are you connected to online? Who's talking about you and in what way? What does it look as though you've done? What's your track record? and so on. Um, they're also looking to see where, what the risk would be if they were to work with you or to not work with you. And again, they're doing this by looking about the content that they can find, not only from your website, but importantly from the social media channels. And the biggie, they want to know pretty much if they're going to be working with you, can we work with you? And that's also about getting a flavor for your personality, so your, co your company's culture, your organization's culture. Does this feel like a good fit for us? And what's kind of scary is they can get all of that without ever having met you, which is why being able to portray yourself in an appropriate way, both on and offline, is so, so important today. So. I get lots of people who say to me, that's all well and good, but actually, I don't want to be online, and I don't think I really am. Well, today, there's absolutely nowhere to hide. And even if you think that you're not really controlling yourself what's online about you, other people will be putting things online. And I think it's really interesting that you know a lot of the time you don't know what's out there. People are talking about you. They're using your name when they're writing tweets. They'll be doing the same thing when they're writing updates on LinkedIn. They'll mention you on their website if they've worked with you. You go to an event and people will be taking photographs or perhaps taking videos. Those are ending up online. That's why they're doing it. So even when you think you're kind of keeping yourself away from all of that, you're probably not. And therefore, one of the things that I do think it's really essential that we all do is that we sit down and we think, which are those online channels where I might appear? And do this. 
is get out there and own your name. So by that, I mean, for example, if you're not already on LinkedIn, put, set up a LinkedIn profile in your name. If you know that you regularly use videos, you'll probably be already online, so that probably wouldn't apply, but you need a YouTube channel in the right name for either your organization or you as appropriate. If Twitter is a mechanism that your customers, your suppliers, people you work with are actually interested in and are on, then make sure that you have a Twitter name for your business, your organization, or yourself, and so on. So own your name, even for channels that perhaps you're not using, so that at least nobody else can take your name and then start to use it, and then you have, you have the concerns that they are then perhaps people are seeing the wrong person uh, out there. So that's kind of important. But people say to me, but you know what, this really, really scares me. I don't want to be in the public eye. And I fully understand that, but there are things that you can do. And one of the things that I have done is that I've separated, to a certain extent, some of my personal life from my public life. And as those of you who know me will know, that's quite difficult for me because I am me and people tend to get to know me and I'm very open as a person. But I've done this. I've actually looked at it and said there are some things that I don't want in the public eye. And that's not about me hiding things, but I have a private Facebook account which is very, very strong on my privacy settings, which only my closest friends and my family I have actually accepted friend requests on. And I'm very clear about that, and I explain it to all the lovely, wonderful, amazing people that I meet who want to be my friend on Facebook, that actually that's what I do. And part of the reason that I do that is because as a family, we then share photographs of our little ones through Facebook, but we can do it knowing safely those photographs aren't going to end up anywhere else. So I do that, and that gives me that little element of privacy around things. So I have my public self, which I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, and so on, but on Facebook, my own private Facebook page is just for me and my family and close friends. And I have a little rule of thumb on that. If you don't know how my dining room is painted, you don't become my friend on Facebook. And that kind of works really, really well. It was a tip that somebody gave me a long time ago when they were going through an adoption process. It was how it had been explained to them. And I kind of figured that worked for me personally. So if you're not comfortable with having everything about your life out there, make sure that you look at that. But it's a fantastic news about how this works now with online. Is You've got an open door to pretty much anyone. So a few years ago, if you'd wanted to contact a politician or you'd wanted to contact a journalist or you'd wanted to contact a funder, the only way you would have been able to do it would have been to try and get to them in writing through emails perhaps or through a phone call. And as we know, their gatekeepers are superb at keeping us out. But these days, with, with online mechanisms, you can get to anyone. So when you start to think about the possibilities of that, you know, if you're a charity, the ability to actually engage appropriately with someone and attract the attention of a potential high-profile patron would be fabulous. You know, if you're a social enterprise, the opportunity to share your impact in a way in which it gets in front of fund potential funders, commissioners, supporters, and influencers would be invaluable. If you're somebody who actually is looking to develop and grow, then learning from the way in which other people have done that, you know, on, entrepreneurs who share their journeys online, big people like Richard Branson, is you know, the kind of opportunity that you just wouldn't have got a few years ago. And here are just some examples of who you can find online and how easy it is to access them. So the first thing is that most of the big funders are online. So you can actually get, alongside all your funding alerts, you can get notification of new funds that they're thinking about that might be coming online by following them on mechanisms such as Twitter or on Facebook or whichever ones it is that they're using. And alongside that, you get the opportunity then to join in discussions with them and to look at, they're often doing consultations that you will hear about, which gives you an opportunity to influence that. So the Big Lottery is one example there on Twitter. 
You can also talk to the support agencies. So my very good friends who are running this webinar, Unlimited, are very active online. They're active on Twitter. They have the, a fantastic LinkedIn group that's very active and so on. So if you want to know what Unlimited are doing, to have, connect with them, to understand more about them, and perhaps to also showcase appropriate your organization to them, you have that opportunity to do so, even if you don't know at this stage who the right person is to put yourself in front of. And as well as those nationals, your local ones are on here. So this is Greater Manchester, Greater Manchester CVA. And that's, again, you can see opportunities for events. So you may miss them when they're sending out on the mailing list, but you see events. I see funds that they're looking at. I get invited to consultation events through that. I can make my opinion known, even if I wouldn't have been able to attend that event through that, and so on. And that's absolutely invaluable at presenting opportunities and also helping me to understand what's happening within my local community. And it will be exactly the same for you with your local support organizations. But you can also get to key people within those wonderful organizations, so the funders, the support agencies, and so on. This is Carl, Carl Wilding from NCBO. Now, I rather suspect most of us, if we picked up a phone call and tried to talk to Carl, actually he's really nice, he probably would answer, but you know, that would be somewhat more difficult. However, attracting his attention through Twitter, which he's very active in, easy. So recently he's been doing a lot of work around um, looking at things like his, his policy, he looks at policy, so things like, you know, should uh, um, charities be allowed to campaign? Well, the opportunity to get your view in front of NCBO and to read the views of others, again, is an opportunity you would never have had before. And it's a way to position yourself as an expert. So, you know, if you're an expert in campaigning, if you have a strong view to put forward, you can do it in a positive and appropriate way, you have an opportunity to do it in a forum with an influencer who will also be followed and engaged with by other influencers who will also see and get to know you. And it's quite interesting because I don't think, I can't think of a time when I've actually been in a room with Carl, but Carl and I actually do feel like we know each other and he does actually direct message me out, you know, outside the public domain on things and that's a relationship we built entirely through Twitter and I'm quite sure if I picked a phone up to him now, he would talk to me. We also find commissioners on there, a lot of the clinical commissioning groups are on there for example. And again, that's a great opportunity to understand what they're thinking and what their hotspots are, which will inevitably help you when you're thinking of bidding, and also when you're trying to influence them before they come out to tender, so that you can talk to them about local needs, you can talk to them about services you could provide, and again, it's a way to enter a conversation that you wouldn't have had previously. Politicians, from our Prime Minister to your local MP, are pretty much all online. And again, you have almost a direct route through to them. So not only can you understand what they're thinking, but you have an opportunity to engage with them. You know, and one great example is Kate Green, who's an MP for Ermston in our area, is really, really good at engaging with the third sector in particular through, through her online channels. So she puts on bulletins about um, you know, debates that she's attended in the House of Commons. She supports them very avidly and promotes their events and so on to her audience. So it's a superb channel to get noticed for the right reasons. Our journalists, notoriously difficult to get hold of, apart from perhaps on your local paper. But again, all of a sudden you've got a route into these people. And there's an interesting example of how this worked recently for a charity and social enterprise that I did some work with. Um, they are undoubtedly experts at what they do. However, they don't have a particularly high profile in the public domain, and that's because what they do is pretty specialized. Uh, they deal with suicide prevention. So on this instance, with some very careful tweeting um, online, around what they do in response to some um, comments that have come out recently in the press and articles in the press. We were successful within a couple of weeks of doing that. They were invited to actually provide an opinion to The Guardian and they did actually have an approach by the BBC. Now, as it happens, neither of us ultimately led to something, but that is the world of journalism. However, to be approached by The Guardian and to be approached by the BBC, it just shows the power of how you can do that. And over a period of time, those relationships have continued, and they are now up there on the radar screen of national 
national media as well as local media to talk about, to give comments on subjects that they're experts on. And then the celebrities and the big online entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs and so on, the majority of those are also readily available through their social media channels. Um, you can easily tweet people like Richard Branson and they do tweet back. You know, you can contact them to their Facebook groups and they do respond. So it's really, really interesting that these days you've got that open door. But of course that means what's so, so important is that you think long and hard about what it is you want to be known for and how you want to be perceived. So, thinking about attracting the right attention rather than the wrong attention, here's one of the things that I, that I suggest that people look at. The first thing is to think about what is it you're really trying to do? So if you want to attract attention, what is it you want to attract attention for? Is it that actually you want to get people interested in what you do? Do you want to, to, to actually generate demand for what you do? Or have you actually got a call to action and you actually want them to, to, to do something, to act? And that kind of helps to focus your attention. But one of the things that I think is really important is that when you're looking to attract attention, particularly in a digital world, is it's like a conversation. However, it's a conversation that you can join but in the same way that you would never do it in the real world, is you can't just butt into a conversation and take it over, because of course that would be exceptionally rude. So some of the things that you do is that you start to follow and to take part in the forums that the people that you want to attract attention are active in. And as a starting point, you start by doing things like this. So you like material that they put up there, but only like something if you really do like it. You share it if you think it's valuable. You might also comment on it in a very positive way. Alongside that, if you see an opportunity, you would connect people who are participating in that conversation to either other people who would be particularly useful for them or to other content that they might find really interesting. And then as you start to do that and you start to get to know them better, this is where it becomes important. There will be things that you want to put out there, but there are things that they're interested in. The bit where you start to attract the right attention is if you can match what you want to say to what they're interested in. So in the case that I mentioned before with Storm, what we did is looked at the point at which mental health and well-being was very high on the agenda for a couple of weeks around the time in which they had a health and safety week of all things, which includes mental health. And there were a number of articles, there were a number of documentaries that were very much around a mental health and suicide. And so the, the team over in Storm started to actually uh, tweet with their expertise, they responded to things, they put positive con con so content on there that would be positively viewed as being supportive and helpful. And that intersection, the journalists were interested in mental health and suicide at that point, together with the messages that they provide about suicide prevention, how prevalent suicide is, and how we can all do things to help, that intersection is what got them the attention. Another good example in there is a, a small charity that I'm a trustee of, which is the LGBT Cancer Support Charity. Um, as a charity, they wanted to attract the attention of a particular high-profile person who they would like to be a patron at some point in the future. And again, we've never met that person. That person is extremely careful about who they, who they follow. So they have thousands and thousands and thousands of followers online, but they only follow a handful themselves. So in that instance, what we actually did was I looked very closely at the timing. When was this person actually online? I looked at what were they tweeting about, because they were on Twitter, and that was how we decided to, to actually get to them. What was it that they seemed to be particularly interested in? And then I started to converse with them on behalf of the charity through their Twitter account at the time this person was online by responding directly to content that they were putting on and offering some of ours in a really low-key, appropriate way. I did it for a week. At the end of that week, that person directly responded to us and said, 
I really like what you're doing and what you stand for. Please keep me informed and started to follow us. We're one of only 380 something that uh, that he follows now on Twitter, but you know, he is followed by I can't remember something like 40, 50,000. So we've attracted the right attention. Of course, then we have to maintain that attention over a long period of time. So we still do it. So we don't. Um, we're very, very careful about how we do it. So we're not seen as intrusive or stalking, but we are maintaining a conversation with him. So at some point in the appropriate in the future, we will actually look to ask him to come on board as our patron. And that's a great example of how to attract the right attention. One of the other things is to piggyback on the back of something that's particularly topical to them. In the same way that Storm did around it being a lot of issues around mental health that week, is if you can find something that's particularly interesting to them, that and then make sure that you're timing some of the attention you're seeking around that, you will find it a lot easier to attract that attention. So, here's the big question. In today's day and age, what are they going to find out about you? And one of the things that I, I, I found really interesting is I discovered quite by accident that some of the people who I do work for, so funders who fund some of the work that I do on funded programs, actually have mechanisms and processes in place to regularly check what I am putting out there online. And that's why it is so vitally important that you think long and hard about what you put into the public domain. And this isn't about trying to constrain anyone or gag anyone or stop you from expressing your opinions, but it's actually thinking about what that means. So I have seen personally an instance uh, in the last 12 months where um, an organization that wanted to participate in a funded program, so to take advantage of some support that was being made available by a funder, was specifically excluded. And the reason was that they'd been quite vociferous in line, in act online, about actually putting negative comments about a particular industry. But the funder comes from that industry, and funnily enough, they decided that they didn't think that was appropriate. So it is really interesting how much scrutiny actually goes on, because there's so much you can find out. And if you want to test that for yourself, put your, the name of your organization or of yourself or of anyone else that you have onto, onto Google and onto other search engines and you'd be really surprised what, what came up. I actually had a little tip from a PR agency that um, I, I visited for a different purpose and they said to me that I needed to put a Google alert on, which is really easy. If you go to Google alerts and I now have a Google alert on my name. That's been really interesting because the other week I appeared in two, two in, uh, there were two articles on me in two different, um, uh, one was a local press, a local press up in Cumbria, the other one was actually something national, a national magazine. Um, I didn't provide either of those articles, neither to the best of my knowledge did anyone else, but you know, the journalists have actually taken things that they've seen about me and have regurgitated that into a different article. And so keeping an eye on what people are saying about you, but just on a simple level, you'd be surprised, really, really surprised at how often your name comes up, and sometimes in contexts that you weren't expecting. So I'm going to show you some examples of how not to do it, uh, just because actually it's almost easier to show it that way. But I don't know if anybody remembers uh, this young lady, Paris Brown, who was picked as one of the, the czars for, for some government initiative. Um, and one thing that was interesting, whoever actually brought it on it was, uh, as part of a police thing, hadn't actually checked online, which would be very unusual these days. As you can see, it's probably not that, that surprising that her tenure in that role was extremely short-lived. She was supposed to represent young people. Now, it was extremely short-lived, and I'm sure that she's learned a really valuable lesson from that, but whatever content you put out there online, it's no longer owned by you, and it's out there forever. It doesn't disappear. It's not like newspapers that become chip papers and then end up in the bin. It actually doesn't disappear, and with some careful searching, people can still find it, hence it being so important that you also think about when you're posting photographs from private Facebook pages, making sure your privacy settings are set. If they're photographs you prefer not to be shared online with anyone else. I mean, 
this also is, is one that's just happening repeatedly. Uh, this one is very, very extreme, a young lady who'd, who'd actually forgotten that she'd added her boss as a friend on Facebook and then went on a rant about him and subsequently lost her job. So it's pretty extreme, but I see lots of these where most surprising of people who actually I've got a great deal of respect for, you suddenly find something online by accident where they've actually gone on a little bit of a personal rant and I completely respect their views but hadn't realized what the impact of that might be on, on their work moving forward. And again, this isn't about trying to stop you having opinions. I have really strong opinions. People who know me will tell you that, and I'm not afraid to express them, but I tend to express everything in a very positive way, and I tend to actually bite my tongue over some things because I think that's likely to come back and haunt me, and perhaps wouldn't just shoot from the hip, but would think about putting it off cost there in a more considered way. Um, but that one is so, so big and it's one to really, really watch because you'd be quite surprised at what turns up on particularly some um, surprising things turn up on people's websites and in people's Facebook pages and on Twitter that you would not expect and I'm sure they're mortified that are actually appeared there. Um, this one is actually really quite serious and um, there were a number of Welsh councils who actually uh, sacked staff and disciplined them over their misuse of social media. And this was actually about bringing the council into disrepute. So these were people who were doing this entirely on their own. These weren't people who were being uh, doing this um, on work time. Some of them weren't, that was slightly different, but weren't doing it on work time, weren't doing it with work equipment. So that wasn't an issue. It was actually that they were expressing opinions that were, were brought the council into such severe disrepute whether that was about the way in which the council was run or that one of them, I think, was, if I remember correctly, was racist comments and so on, that actually resulted in them losing their jobs or being disciplined. And again, it shows that even when you think people aren't watching it, you'd be surprised how many people see things and how they then pass that on. So, what should you be looking out for? Well, I would always do a search on your organisation and see what's out there and think about what do you want to be known for and how do you want to be known. I would also do that on yourself on a regular basis. Key members of your team, do you really know what they're saying about your organization, your service users, your customers, your suppliers, your commissioners, your funders? And if you are a charity or similar, trustees as well. And again, none of this is about constraining people, but forewarned is forearmed, and actually, at some point, you may also want to think about whether you need to put some guidelines out there as well to help with that. So what do you want to be noticed for? Well, this is what I think is probably the most important thing. This is Shakespeare's, to thine own self be true. And that, for me, captures absolutely the essence of getting noticed for all the right reasons, is don't try and copy someone else. You can only be you, and your organization has a unique personality, and that personality absolutely needs to come through. However, as part of that, it's really helpful to think about these things, is I've, throughout this, I'm conscious that perhaps you've been picking up, you know, that you need to be quite cautious, and that's absolutely true, but you need to be authentic. So, those of you who know me will know that I'm bright, I'm bubbly, I'm energetic, I'm very positive, I talk in lots of exclamation marks, and that's exactly what I'm like online and offline. So, there's an authenticity. I want people to say, yeah, that's Melanie when they meet me not thinking, oh, that's somebody very different. Yes, that's why not change. Yes, that's exactly what I was expecting. And that also means being really, really clear on your values. So if you're a third sector organization, then you've probably spent considerable time thinking about your values. And it's really important that those are reflected on everything that you do and say. So the whole experience of coming across your organization needs to be consistent with that. And that's the third thing. Consistency is in the same way that you're always you and your organization is always your organization when it shows up anywhere, that should also extend to being online as well as offline. So what do you want to be noticed for as an organization? 
Is it your work with particular service users? Is it the way that you do your work? Is it the impact that you make? But whatever it is, be really, really clear so that you know the kinds of messages that you then want to be putting out. And here's why. Because there's a really interesting thing that the world has moved on and people decide on the credibility of organizations and the people that lead them and work within them really, really quickly. And they make snap judgments based a lot on very limited information that a lot of that they see about you before they even meet you. So the key to attracting the right attention is moving that, that arrow from being zero credibility to lots of credibility and building trust. So, how do we do that? Well, the first thing is about that consistency. Once you've decided you know what your values are, you know what it is you stand for, you know what it is you want to be known for, then people need to see that in everything that you do. So I talk about the, part, the biggest thing that I'm here for is to help organizations to become more sustainable, make a bigger difference by doing so. So bigger positive difference. So everything that I put out there is that I put out under my own name is about being, making a bigger positive difference in some way. This is an interesting one. Being up to date. Now, that's up to date in your thinking. That's absolutely right as well because you need to show current the currency when you're actually um, you know, being ahead of the game, being up there at the top. But it's also about making sure that the things that you put out are up to date. So if you decide to go down the route of working with any social media channel, then you need to make sure that you're doing it on a regular basis. You know, I was with an organization the other week and they told me that they, they, they really thought they were doing really well online. And I said, well, you were doing, but you haven't actually put anything online since November. And they said, is that a problem? I said, well, yes, because your members, your service users, your funders, your commissioners, your suppliers, and everybody who knows you actually thinks you've disappeared because we're now heading into March and you've put nothing up since November. So you have channels that actually are used on a daily basis by other people so it's not like a website where it's been perhaps quite static and that wouldn't matter, but you've set yourself up on these, you've gained a following, and then you've let them down because you haven't actually maintained that. And in those instances, it would be better just to have a holding page and to not do it at all. The other thing is, are you credible? People are going to take a lot more notice about the things that other people say about you in that respect, because you can say that you're fantastic, and you, I'm sure that you are, but if you have a service user that says the difference you've made to their lives, if you have a commissioner who says how fantastically you've delivered a contract and so on, that's really powerful. And these days, you can get a much wider reach because previously you might have sent out in a newsletter and that's great. It will go to the people who are already subscribed. But those people who don't know you wouldn't have seen that. So those people sitting out there who thought, actually, I'm looking for someone who can, wouldn't have found you. But these days, by encouraging the people who would say great things about you to share that through their online channels, you can reach a much, much wider organization, a much, much wider audience. The other thing is this, awards. Awards and so on and similar and accolades actually do add credibility because it tells people that you've been assessed by somebody external who has decided that amongst a, a room of your peers, you stood out for all the right reasons. So if you have got awards, then please don't be shy with them. Please do make sure that you actually do, do use those as a way to open doors for you, to help you to further the work that you do and thereby make a much bigger positive impact. And if you haven't got awards, then you might want to sit down and think about perhaps actually whether there are any that you might be able to nominate yourself or the people who work with you for. Because here's an interesting one. My, my husband, as I said, ha has a social enterprise. He does gardening, handy personal landscaping services for the elderly and disabled to help them live, stay living in their own homes. And one of the things he does is he employs somebody with learning disabilities. And relatively early on, we put that person forward for an adult learning award. Now, you can imagine how absolutely thrilled he was when he actually won that award and you know as we absolutely were for him too 
and that was done entirely for all the right reasons and not only has it made a massive difference to his self-esteem and to his life and to his confidence and he's now seen as an aspirational role model for other people with learning disabilities but inevitably on the back of that it also built the credibility of my husband's organization and as a direct result he was asked by one of the councils to do a piece of work that he wouldn't ever have been seen for otherwise they saw the article on Corey in the local newspaper. So again, it's attracting attention for the right reasons and not necessarily by directly shining the spotlight on yourself. This is another one, speaking. Speakers are almost inevitably seen as being credible. If you speak at conferences and events locally as well as nationally, and it doesn't have to be regionally and nationally, it can just be locally, then again, it raises your credibility and it also gives you a new audience. And also, in these days, you probably find that half the audience is, is sitting there with their mobile phone in front of them, and that can be really off-putting as a speaker, but, but smile sweetly, because what they're probably doing is actually sharing that online in real time, and thereby actually in extending your reach and helping you to attract more of the right attention. And then this, your network. Your network talking about you is talking now to a much bigger network of people who don't know you and then the people who don't know you are also passing that on to more people who don't know you because it's so quick and easy to do it. We don't have to pick up a phone, we don't have to be there in person, we can do it by the click of a button and that means that your credibility can grow really, really quickly as well um, through, through actually extending that reach. So, with that in mind, one caveat is, is it time to spring clean your online profiles? The first thing I would say is, do you even know where you appear online? Now, I did this as an audit recently, um, not only for myself, but for a number of other organizations as well. We did it in a little peer-to-peer -peer group, and we were shocked because half of us had forgotten half of the online profiles that we'd actually got. Now, that's not about the ones we use regularly, like Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube. It was actually about the ones that we don't use very often, where we'd registered on di online directories for uh, various programs or for third sector you know, support groups and so on. And we were really quite shocked at how out of date some of those were. So one thing to do is to keep a list of all the places where you appear and then have a process in place to make sure that you regularly look at those and make sure that they're up to date. Now, what we also found um, was that in some instances we'd started to complete online profiles, they'd been published, and we hadn't actually got around to ever going back to finish them off. So there was incomplete information. So making sure for each of the ones that you do have, that you have actually updated them, you've got them so that they are complete, so you've filled in all the sections, is also going to be good practice. And then as I say, making sure that you update them every time something significant changes, or at least on a regular basis. That way, if anybody's looking at you, then you know that they're getting the impression that you're well run, that you're on the ball, that you actually take this seriously. But then there's another one. People out there don't necessarily know you, but you'd kind of like them to think they do. So if you're using a photo, which most of us do do certainly on our personal profiles like LinkedIn and so on, what does it actually say about you? And here's the interesting thing, you know, there are plenty of times when I think selfies are great, I use them a lot of conferences and events, not on my online profiles. Similarly, you know, none of us are, are daft, you know, I can see if you've cut that, if you've kind of tried to cut that glass of wine off, or you've cut your other half off, or, or your friend standing at the side of you. So think about what the photograph needs to say about you. And through this, I'm not saying that I'm expecting you to go out there and do one of these really corporate shots because that's not me and it never will be and it wouldn't fit with my organization unless it is you and it fits with your organization. So thinking about what you want it to say. So here's a great example also. Don't choose the photograph that you like of yourself best. Ask around. This photograph was taken from an inspirational women's calendar and it was taken by a professional photographer who chose the photograph that they liked best to go on the calendar. When I first saw this photograph, I hated it. It's of me. I hated it. And then I, I showed it round along with the two others that I really liked and family, friends, colleagues and so on went, that's a fantastic shot of you. And I'm like, no, it's not. I don't like it. I hate it. I don't want to use it. But the reason is, 
I never see myself laughing. So whenever I look in the mirror, that doesn't look like me at all. So make sure that to other people that captures how they see me a lot. Happy, bubbly, energetic laughing. So always, always take an opinion on whether the photograph that you're going to use actually portrays what you want it to portray. And as you can see, I'm pretty colourful, and therefore this is another photograph that I use a lot because it conveys a number of messages very quickly, and it also stands out on a sea of grey and black suits really, really well. But here's a great example um, of another lady who actually has made her profile pictures really stand out too. These have been taken in the City of London, but it's not what you would call a typical city shot, is it? So she's being kind of quirky with the bowler hat and so on, but it stands out and I get an immediate feeling for what her brand is and what it would be like to work with her. Don't be afraid to use props and to show you in the workplace doing what you really do. This is a Royal Food Company over in um, over in Liverpool, and you know this is absolutely how that lady looks. You know, and it's amazing. She's a grandmother, and she certainly that Royal Food thing obviously works. But here is a recycling company who actually deals with recycling clothes. You know, it doesn't need to be to be boring. This is absolutely spot on for their brand. Another one, a local photographer to me, a little girl with a big camera, again, completely you get the feeling she's not your typical she's not your typical photographer. But people then say, ah, oh, yes, but you know, horses for courses. But here's an accountant. Now, that photograph to me says friendly, approachable, like me. So thinking about what your photo says about you. And that's not about, and again, it's about standing out for the right reasons, whatever it is that works for what your organization is and does. So stand out in the right way. And if you get it right, this is what's really fascinating, is this should never happen. Because if you get it right, when somebody meets you for the first time, what they're actually saying is, I recognize you. I remember you and you're exactly as I thought you would be because that's about being authentic, living by your values, being consistent. People will actually think that they're friends with you and I get this quite a lot. I had it happen to me on Saturday. This was really quite funny. I took my little five-year-old grandson to a play centre. We were actually playing in the snow, in the snow centre. And this lady came bounding up to me and said, hi, hello, Melanie, hello, Melanie. And I recognized her face, which was great, because when you're in helmets and snow suits, it's not always the case, you know. And she clearly recognized me immediately um, and taught me as though we knew each other really, really well. And yet we don't. But she feels that she knows me really well because of the relationship that she's built with me through online and offline, offline events and so on. And this is where it gets interesting. When you get that right online as well as offline, then what you also end up is in this situation. So people start to think that they know you, they like you, they trust you, and then when you're in your area, you actually get to meet them in person. And this has happened to me a few times recently where people who I've only ever got to know online, a the relationship with, and a good working relationship with, have then said to me, I'm coming into your area, let's have coffee. And then that has led on to some really, really interesting collaborations moving forward. So that's what happens if you get it right. But what I would say is going back to the Shakespeare again, to be thine, to thine own self be true, is don't try and copy other people. Do it in a way that's completely authentic for you. Make it your voice, your voice and the voice of your organization. And I'm going to leave you there with the words of Dr. Zeus. Because there, it's absolutely true. There is no one alive who is fewer than you. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've uh, uh, we've uh, got a pitch there. Uh, campaign uh, and uh, organization uh, visibility, uh, which doesn't uh, cost anything other than uh, really good information. Good information. Uh, great examples of how to. Uh, uh, in attracting the right in the world too, and also for following potential people first to find out about what's going to know about what's happening. Really good stuff there. I think my computer is still echo, so I. Don't know.
I've had a message from the inspiring presentation. She's just got a question about keeping her wet she has very limited website and you know, to know someone at the moment. So what do you suggest she does at the meantime? Uh, she's had a website developed which is free blog post, but it does not seem to go. So do you have any suggestions to her to help her increase the profile with her website? Yeah, I just missed the, the end of that, Julie. I'm sorry you were fading in and out again. So the late, they have a website already. They don't have um, anyone to actually manage that for them at the moment. That's right. I just missed the end of that. Yeah. So the question is about what can we do to keep it up to date? So she wants to know how to have the website up to date. Okay. The, it depends a little bit. I, first thing to say is I am the original woman who is not in the slightest bit geeky and doesn't understand technology at all. I have to have help to put batteries in things. So I want to declare that up front. So hence why everything I'm telling you is things that I actually can do myself, which means that anybody can do it. Yes. So on the website, yes. the, the big lesson that I learned, and this is very much do as I say and not as I've done because I'm in the process of actually addressing this, is that websites need to, de to be developed in um, a template that you can actually then change the content on yourself. So that's typically on something like WordPress, which most of them are done on today, which is just a, it's really something that you can really, really easily, once you've been shown, go into and make changes yourself on your own screen. And that's what I have for my Northwest Women's Enterprise Day website. Um, and that means that whenever I feel like it, including yesterday, I can go on and I can make changes to the content myself. That makes, makes it much, much easier because I can add into there things like uh, new photographs, which makes it start to look a little bit fresher, new events. And as part of those is having some form of um, very, very easy for somebody to do where they actually, if you're already on Twitter, for example, or on Facebook, they show that feed coming through on your website page actually makes it look current day in, day out. So that's one thing. Why I say do as I say and not as I do is for my own why not change website. I needed a website years ago for a particular bid I was putting together as a requirement for the bid. A friend threw me a website up. Their website, they were a developer, an IT person, then disappeared. And I've been stuck with a website for years that I can make no changes to. That has been resolved because I couldn't even get it taken down because I didn't know how to do it because he had all the, the, the um, passwords and everything. So um, these days it's much, much easier. But think about what content you would have that would stay the same and what content you would have that changes. So in terms of updating things, if you have a little news section or something like that, that's the, or, or a blog, that's the bit you update. The rest of it probably stays the same for a great deal of the time. You might update some facts and figures you know, once a year when you've got your annual report coming through. But other than that, the rest of that probably pretty much stays the same. So you make it easy on yourself. The other thing is that depending on your organization, a lot of the ones I've been working with these days have found that offering this out as a, a sort of professional volunteering opportunity has been fantastic because there's plenty of people out there who do know how to do this and very well, who do want to volunteer, don't necessarily have large pockets of time because they're typically working in, you know, in, in that field themselves, but actually will be more than willing to update your website. I've been surprised. I've got a volunteer who's sorting out um, updating my, my, my website for me. And just really, really happy to do it. A professional person wouldn't want to commit to volunteering for me week in, week out, but is really happy to do that for me. Right. Thank you for that. Yeah. And asked how she could get the volunteer opportunity. I'm really sorry, Judith. I can't hear you at all on that when you've, you've faded out again. Yeah. Nikki just asked, can you offer her some advice as to how she can offer a the volunteering opportunity? I'm sorry, a what opportunity? A volunteering opportunity. Oh, how she can offer a volunteering opportunity. Yeah. Sorry, Melanie. I know, I know, I know. Sorry, if anyone doesn't know, Julie and I were having problems with this earlier today. We hoped it resolved itself, but it, 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 technology, what can we say? <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of offering a volunteering opportunity, 
Um, I went out to my network. So I, I have an online forum for women entrepreneurs. It's got about a thousand members on it, and I'm on Twitter and so on. And I asked around. I said, I really need some help with. I'd love to find somebody who'd like to volunteer for me to do that. Can anyone help? And I was really surprised because I kind of thought that I wasn't going to get many responses, and I got lots saying, yes, I can. But one of the things, I have a very small social enterprise that I work with in Blackpool. And they're tiny, very fledgling. And they, they went out, and they were really pleasantly surprised that they got a superb volunteer who um, actually is a local business person. They, and all they did was they asked, they went to a business networking event and said, I could really do with some help with, and I was just looking for someone who might be interested in updating some content on my website for my blog. And we don't really know quite how to do that. And they not only got somebody in who showed them how to do it, but also said, look, I don't mind doing this because I can do it in sort of half an hour a week. And actually has started to curate a lot of content for them. I think it's asking around your networks, but be really, really clear about what you want, and also be really, really clear about what you don't want. So in that instance, with that small social enterprise, they set some very clear guidelines that said this is the type of content that we would like to share through our social media channels, and this is the type of content we don't. That's great. Thank you. For that. And somebody's just mentioned, uh, thanks Lucy, you could also contact local universities. Yeah, absolutely. All of the local universities will also be online. I do a lot of work at Manchester Metropolitan University, particularly their Centre for Enterprise. And again, you know, they're a wonderful source of, of, of information. Uh, but alongside that, and um, this might be what Lucy is, is also um, suggesting, is that they have students who are very, very, very online savvy and are often doing degree courses around that. They're always looking for projects, volunteering opportunities for paid and, and unpaid un internships. So absolutely a fantastic resource to use. Right, thank you. That. I think that's all the questions for today. I'm sorry I'm struggling I'm with my sound quality. I think we'll finish it there. Uh, Melanie, again, for support for unlimited amount of work. Uh, I'm sure, uh, I hope Melanie's answered some questions today and given you a great insight on how to do your communication strategy to get notice for the right thing to say. I know I'm going to spring from my profile after today, Melanie, so thank you for that. Good. <laughs> I'll check. <laughs> so our next webinar will be in April. And we have our new programme kicking off in April, so kick us out by detail. And once again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the poor quality at my end. I'd like to wish you all a good afternoon and thanks for joining us.